welcome to our show Health and Wellness, Myths vs. Facts. The endocrine system is a network of glands that produce and release hormones. These hormones are responsible for various functions in the body, from heartbeat to tissue growth to the creation of new life. Diabetes mellitus is one of the most common endocrine disorders that affects the body's ability to produce or use insulin. Worldwide, 537 million adults are currently living with diabetes. The number of people with diabetes in India is the second highest in the world. Over 77 million adults are living with diabetes in the country. And the worst part is that diabetes in India starts at a relatively young age, almost a decade earlier than in Western countries. Early onset of diabetes increases the risk of associated complications. Education is one of the most important components to ensure better management and control of diabetes. There's also evidence that improving knowledge about diabetes and its complications has significant benefits, including increased adherence to treatment, thus a reduction in complications associated with diabetes. There are many misconceptions about the disease prevention as well as management of diabetes. It's only by raising awareness that we can help everyone else to understand what we live with. In our program, our experts provide medically accurate and actionable advice on preventing diabetes and help viewers identify strategies for long-term control. So let's uh, just uh, talk to our doctors. We have uh, Dr. Jacob, Professor and Head of Endocrine and Diabetes Unit at Christian Medical College and Hospital in Ludhiana. We also have Dr. Madhu uh, joining us. Uh, that's a Director and Professor, Department of Endocrinology, Center for Diabetes, Endocrinology and Metabolism, the University College of Medical Sciences and JTB Hospital here in Delhi. A very good afternoon and thank you so much for joining us here on the program. Uh, let me take my first uh, question to Dr. Jacob. What are the target values for blood glucose levels for the management and the treatment of diabetes? Does the presence of diabetes complications and other comorbid conditions affect these target levels? Dr. Jacob. Uh, thank you for inviting me to the program. I think uh, with chronic diseases, we don't believe that the absence of symptoms is what is achievable. I mean, we are organs are still getting damaged even when you don't have any symptoms. So that is why we have targets. And these targets, what is traditionally accepted for preventing long-term complication is to use a test called HbA1c or glycosylated hemoglobin, which usually tells us what the sugar is like for the last three years, uh, three months. And using that, we target it to between 6.5 to 7%. Saying that, I think you should remember there are some caveats. One of the caveats is that if you are a younger patient with longer life in front of you, you can try and achieve HbA1c's as near to normal as possible if it is achievable without too many side effects of the drug, if it is achievable without too many hypoglycemic episodes. Now, the second part of the question is if you've already developed comorbidities, or that means you have already developed some of those complications of diabetes, then you need to be a little more relaxed because you are not now preventing complications. You have already developed them, like patients with heart failure, patients with chronic kidney disease, patients who have a limited life expectancy. We relax targets. We keep it 7.5, even 8 is acceptable. Somebody who is at the end of his life, even patients uh, where we control the sugars just to control symptoms is more than enough. So I hope uh, that answers that question. Right, it totally does. Uh, we also have Dr. Varma, endocrinologist, uh, Harsha Diabetes and Endocrine Clinic from Bhima Varma joining us this afternoon. Uh, well, uh, Dr. Varma, let me take my next question to you. Many people with type 2 diabetes are asymptomatic. When do symptoms start appearing in these patients and what are the recommendations for type 2 diabetes uh, screening in asymptomatic adults? Dr. Varma. Yeah, thank you for having me. Uh, see, as you already told, most of the uh, diabetic patients that uh, usually develop in the early parts of the disease, they are usually asymptomatic. And the uh, symptoms that they develop usually depend on the uh, glucose levels at the point of interaction with us. And uh, usually at around early stages of diabetes or pre-diabetes, they are asymptomatic and they usually develop excessive thirst, weight loss, slight blurring of vision or some foot pains or tingling and numbness in your foot. And if you come to the screening part of this, uh, see, uh, screening for diseases is again an important part So uh, because the burden of diabetes is such high that 
if uh, we don't diagnose them properly then the risk of uh, getting complications is uh, very high and screening it usually is advised for all adults who are obese or who are overweight and have some form of uh, risk factors like uh, say dyslipidemia hypertension a cvd or a close relative who is having diabetes or who is uh, physically not uh, having a significant exercise regimen so those people are at high risk and they do requires constant screening if we consider asymptomatic adults then usually we start screening after say 35 years of age and uh, again continuation of the screening it depends either yearly or three yearly depending on the uh, risk profile of the patient and this screening we usually do by either uh, doing a fasting glucose level or three months uh, level that is the hba1c level or ogtt that is uh, doing uh, glucose testing after giving uh, 75 grams of glucose so by this screening we can find out whether the person has uh, diabetes or not thank you right uh, people talk about uncontrolled blood sugar what exactly is meant by uncontrolled blood sugar levels when should a person with diabetes start to worry about his or her uncontrolled blood sugar levels dr madhu if you could answer that Uh, thank you uh, when the blood glucose values in a diabetic patient is above the target range and you've heard the targets from dr jumwen if they're not in target and they remain out of target for a sufficient length of time then we generally refer to that condition as uncontrolled sugars in a diabetic patient uh, the patient obviously needs to worry about the sugars if they continue over a length of time and needs to get them under control Firstly, he needs to check on uh, his uh, lifestyle measures, the diet, as well as the exercise adherence. And if not uh, optimum, he should optimize those. And if the sugars remain uncontrolled, then he should visit his physician, because only then uh, some alteration of treatment may be required to bring the glucose under target. And depending on the age, and you've heard Jobin telling you about the targets in different age groups. Now, if you don't have the glucose levels in target or the hbc remains out of range for a length of time that is the problem and that is what leads to several complications in the long run and the whole purpose of treating a diabetic patient is to prevent those long term complications right so if you are living with type 1 or type 2 diabetes continuous glucose monitoring can help you make more informed treatment decisions that can lead to better glycemic control at which stage of diabetes is it considered for use and is it necessary for all people with diabetes dr verma if you could answer that see this uh, cgm technology that is nothing but continuous glucose monitoring systems uh, they have come up in the last 3 to 5 years and they have been quite helpful in uh, treating diabetic patients see the advantage with cgm is uh, it gives a quick at a glance uh, glucose reading and that to continuously for up to 14 days so what we do is we uh, usually uh, keep a small sensor of about say a 1 rupee coin size sensor on your arm and that continuously uh, measures your glucose level for up to 2 weeks so the advantage is we don't require to continuously prick you to get your glucose levels and this uh, technology though it is new it has been quite helpful and again it at the starting stages of its development and we do require some more research on this uh, to uh, to give it to almost all the patients but uh, till now the data that is available shows that it is quite advantageous and it is necessary for type 1 diabetics who are on multiple uh, ins- insulin injections so it is definitely helpful in them in type 2 diabetes again and the persons who are taking uh, insulin it is definitely helpful in them and apart from these two categories like spe- some special categories like people who are unaware of their hypoglycemic episodes like who are not able to detect uh, getting low sugars those type of patients again they will benefit from using this uh, cgms technology and again special populations like elderly who who are more prone for glycemic variations they can be uh, helpful uh, they can get help from this technology and again uh, pregnant patients also where frequent monitoring is required they might benefit from this technology and not only that uh, for normal common diabetic patients also if they are more into say exercising or in the athletic side 
and they want to monitor their glucose levels after each exercise episode or if after each workout then definitely this will be much helpful to them and uh, its use will definitely increase in the next say decade or two decades or so right uh, regular physical exercise is a major part of diabetes management when is the best time to exercise for people suffering from diabetes and what type of exercises are safe for people who might be suffering from diabetes dr jacob yeah so the best time to exercise is the time that is best for the patient to exercise so whichever time they are wanting uh, willing to exercise i think that is the best time but if you ask me in terms of what is the best time which will lower your glucose the answer to that is 1 to 3 hours after a meal but you have to remember if you are on insulin if you are a type 1 diabetic this is the time where also you are at maximum risk of hypoglycemia if you exercise after a meal especially if you exercise say after dinner you are at risk of late night hypoglycemia and that is the reason i would recommend for most patients who are on insulin or glucose lowering drugs they preferably the best time is probably 7 am before breakfast and i think that is what you should stick to the second question was what are the types of exercises i think moderate intensity physical exercise like aerobics walking uh swimming these are i think essential about 150 minutes in a week is essential the other types of exercise that is resistance exercises which includes weight lifting using a a weight a weight machine in a gym these can be added they have benefits over and above aerobic exercises maybe two or three times a week and lastly flexibility exercises and this is something uh, uh, people are fond of yoga i think this is again something that can be added on to the other two and about two to three uh, times a week i think you should add flexibility exercises as well i think and in the minimum aerobic exercises 150 minutes a week but if you can add flexibility and uh, resistance exercises i think that will be best Right now people with diabetes have an increased risk of developing a number of serious health problems which are the most serious and life threatening complications associated with diabetes let me take this question to dr madhu uh thank you divya there could be several uh, complications both in the short term and in the long term and some of them could be really serious and life threatening and we need to know about them in the short term Uh, the blood glucose levels uh, because of various triggers could uh, get into excess of 400 500 or even more and this can be associated with some kind of uh, dehydration and consciousness and even death and become very life threatening we call it a hyperglycemic crisis and this could be result of infection stress or any other trigger and this is in the acute apart from this you could have infections so we all know that infections are quite common in diabetic patients and any of these infections have the potential to spread to the blood stream and become really severe and life threatening at times and we have been seen uh, covid um, uh, causing excess mortality in a diabetic patient uh, apart from this uh, talking of heart attacks heart attacks is again an acute life threatening condition which is much more frequently seen in a diabetic patient it's much more serious many times silent without obvious uh, pain and could straight away end up with complications and and result in sudden death and therefore it's life threatening and we need to uh, always be alert to the possibility of heart attack uh, in the long run i think uh, diabetic kidney disease is one of the long term complications uh, which results in death and uh, although it's a long term complication it could suddenly result in kidney failure because of any more triggers and finally become life threatening of its own complications like let's say diabetes gangrene although usually is only limb threatening can also become life threatening if the infection spreads or the gangrene spreads and the patient can lose his life so there are several complications both in the short term metabolic as we call them or in the long term related to the heart kidney or even the foot which can become life threatening and that's the reason why we tell all patients to have their sugars under control have their associated lipids and and blood pressure under control and be free from the risk of life threatening serious complications Right. Uh, so with that, we're taking a break on our show, Health and Wellness, and with Sir versus Facts, our expert panel of doctors will be joining us on the other side of this very short break. Stay with us.
back to health and wellness myths versus facts. We have Dr. Verma, Dr. Jacob and Dr. Madhu with us. Let me take my next question to Dr. Verma. Why do people with diabetes feel tingling in their feet and legs? It sometimes feels like pain from pins and needles and they hurt a lot. This occurs mostly during the evening and at night. What is this condition called and how can one protect and manage this? Dr. Verma. Yeah. Yes, Deepa, this is the most common complaint uh, with which a diabetic patient comes to the doctor. Uh, mostly pins or needle sensation or tingling sensation. Uh, this is a, a quite common condition called diabetic neuropathy. What happens is that uh, when, uh, when the nervous system gets exposed to a chronically high glucose levels, it gets damaged leading to this neuropathy. The patient can either complain of say tingling and numbness sensation or burning sensation or some of the patients can have a complete loss of sensation or a painful sensation to a simple touch also. And this along with diabetes having a poor lipid control or a high blood, uh, blood pressure levels or say if the patient is a chronic alcoholic or a chronic smoker or if he's having some other vitamin deficiencies, again these neuropathic symptoms are exaggerated. And if you consider this uh, neuropathy also, there are several subtypes of this. So the most common thing that we usually see is a sensory uh, neuropathy in which the nerves affecting the sensory organs like say touch and temperature are affected which leads to this tingling sensation. And apart from this sensory neuropathy, the other things are like say motor neuropathy in which the nerves affecting the uh, muscular actions are affected leading to muscle weakness. Or the other form of neuropathy, which is the most dangerous form, is the autonomic neuropathy, in which the nerves affect the involuntary actions of the body, say like digestion or heart rate, those are affected. So even though these uh, neuropathic symptoms are, say, not that concentrated by the patient, these are quite serious and can lead to quite devastating uh, consequences. And if you come to prevention of these neuropathic symptoms, See, the single most important thing that the patient can do is controlling his blood glucose levels. If the blood glucose level is uh, perfectly under control, then the progression of this uh, neuropathy is uh, halted. And apart from this, if uh, the other things that the patient can do is have a good a balanced diet, a good exercise regimen, uh, having a good footwear to wear, and Correcting his vitamin deficiencies, stopping alcohol and stopping smoking are the other things that the patient can do. And apart from this, every diabetic patient should get their uh, neuropathy uh, tested at least yearly, if not more, depending on the patient condition. Thank you. Right. Uh, so what is glycemic index? What determines whether a food is, say, high or low in GI? Dr. Jacob. Yeah, Divya. Uh, all foods that we eat, if it contains carbohydrate, is going to get digested and going to get converted to glucose. So this uh, glycemic index is what we call, it's a, it's a value from 1 to 100, which we give for a certain food. And it looks at the amount of glucose it can rise up after two hours of consuming this food. So we have foods which are called high glycemic index foods. Those are above 70. Let's say you someone consumes pure glucose that is going to get completely absorbed and that's got a glycemic index of 100. If there is a food which has absolutely no carbohydrate in it, it's got a glycemic index of 1. So high glycemic index foods are the ones which are above 70. Low glycemic index foods are the ones which are below 55. Most of our fruits and vegetables, nuts, pulses, they are all low glycemic index. White bread, white rice, Conflicts, these are all high glycemic index food. Saying that, I think glycemic index in itself is not the most important thing. It's also the amount of carbohydrate that is present in the, in the food. You may have things like ice cream, which actually has a low glycemic index, but we know that it can push up glucose because it has a lot of carbohydrates in it. And the other caveat to remember is these are arbitrary values. So if you cook a food, the glycemic index is going to change. The same fruit, if it is half ripe, it's going to have a lower glycemic index. Now it is overripe, it's going to have a higher glycemic index. And then if you eat processed food, that's also going to increase the glycemic index. So I think these are some things you have to keep in mind when you think about glycemic index of certain foods. 
Right, so we spoke of glycemic index or GI, but what is GL, glycemic load, and how does it affect blood sugar levels? Dr. Madhu, if you could answer that. Thank you. I think Dr. Jubin explained very well uh, the concept of glycemic index. And uh, it's just the, the concept which has been extended a little more to, to make it a glycemic load to try and assess the load that these glycemic index uh, foods would have on the body and what the patient will need to handle. So it's just a multiplying the glycemic index value of a particular food with the amount of, let's say, carbohydrate that you would take per serving uh, uh, in a particular meal. So broadly, it's the load due to the glycemic index of a particular food that is there on an individual which he needs to handle, a diabetic patient particularly, in terms of not allowing uh, the blood glucose levels to rise or easily control them. Now, because this is what tells us the patient um, uh, need to handle, it's an important concept to understand beyond the glycemic index, which as you heard, uh, can change depending upon the processing, depending upon the cooking and many other factors. Now, in general, if we consume larger amounts of low glycemic index foods, some of which uh, Dr. Jubin mentioned, and if we consume smaller amounts of high glycemic index foods, that would keep our overall glycemic load under check. So that's the overall goal. Now, if we want a diet with lower glycemic load, we need to focus on consuming more of whole grains, nuts, legumes, fruits, particularly the low glycemic index uh, fruits like uh, guava, papaya, apple, and even sometimes even unripe banana. Uh, Vegetables which are non-starchy, uh, they would have low glycemic index, as has been said, and other foods also which 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 qualify as low glycemic index foods. We need to have smaller amounts or fewer amounts of high glycemic index foods, particularly potatoes, white bread, processed foods, sugary foods, candies, chocolates, sweet drinks, cakes, all of these which were mentioned also by the, by the other panelists. And if we are able to balance these two in our diet, the load of carbohydrate in a particular meal would not be high or would not tend to reach glucose levels very fast. And that would help maintain reasonable control of our blood glucose values as we attempt to control them by drugs, by diet or by insulin. Right. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Madhu, Dr. Jacob and Dr. Varma for joining us on our show, Health and Wellness, Myths vs. Facts here on NDTV. I'm afraid that's all the time we have today. Thank you so much for tuning in.